Well, hello, friends. Uh, happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas, etc., etc. Welcome to a inadvertent, inadvertently, we'll talk about it in a minute, but inadvertent Christmas episode of Certified Forgotten. This is a Christmas film. I promise you. We'll get to that later. Um, you are watching or listening to the only review podcast that talks about horror films that have five or fewer reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. If there's another one, please tell us so we can report them. That's our shtick. Fuck off, pretenders. I am Matt Monagle. I am one half of your Matt hosts, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime. Um, you know, the just the the inspiration, the the person that I look up to, uh, except not you know physically because I'm taller than him. Matt Donato, how you doing, bud? Can we talk about how my mind was blown that we have an inadvertent Christmas horror movie I didn't even know about? I mean, like you know how many Christmas horror movies I've watched. I'm I'm over 130 at this point, and I didn't even know about this one. So like, yeah, this is good. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I don't want to get into spoilers, but if there is a movie, a horror movie that takes place at Christmas and Donato hasn't seen it, then it is a rare occurrence. So you are here for, it, it is a Christmas miracle that we were able to put one, that our guest was able to put one in front of Donato that he hadn't seen before. So, you know, well, tiny, I, I tiny, was going to say, I, is walking, you know, a bell rang and an angel got its wings. What a pick your trope. I was going to say, it, it's something that I guess I forgot because as we'll get into, this is a uh, festival favorite. So something that I, I can't believe I actually forgot. Well, here to guide us on our journey um, through Christmas Christmas movies of yesteryear, uh, we have a very special guest today. Donato, I'm going to let you handle the introductions. You were practicing it ahead of time. So I'm, I'm just, I'm ready for you to get every piece of it in there. I'm going I'm to do my best here. Today, we welcome to the podcast. One of my friends from New York City, who welcomed me into the community, I would say, of film criticism, also became my headbanging partner at concerts, also a cape enthusiast, and if you haven't guessed already, it's Rebecca Polly, deputy editor at Box Office Pro. Nailed it. Yes, headbanging, deathgasm, deathgasm, demon wind, all of it. I am the influence that Rebecca never needed. And so I apologize for that. And also, you're welcome. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I took my first drink with this man. It was Fireball. Absolutely. And it was all downhill from there. All downhill. So uh, just to put this out ahead of time, this will not be a monogle heavy episode of Certified Forgotten. This is going to be the Rebecca and Donato show. So, I mean, yeah, have fun. Tune in. Um, you know, I think that's I think that's going to be good because I I don't drink Fireball and I don't I don't headbang for nobody. Look, all I'm going to do, I mean, our entire relationship, mine and Matt's, is built on me giving Donato shit, which I feel like anyone can chime in on very easily. You know, I was going to say that's not very. It's not. You, specific, yeah. It's not specific to me by any means. That's not a unique thing for you. Trust me, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose that's very true. All right. Well, let's uh, let's build to that organically then. Uh, let's start, Rebecca, by talking about kind of your relationship to film, especially in the early days. And if somewhere along your way of weaving a narrative, you get the opportunity to shit some more on Donato, like, okay, fine. It just happened organically. We didn't plan it. Um, but, you know, it, for the people that haven't listened to the, the podcast before, welcome, welcome. You know, one of the things we would like to do is we like to get to know our guests early days with the horror genre. And we don't, everybody that we bring on the podcast is not necessarily a full-time horror critic or somebody that specializes. You know, there are pockets within every form of journalism of people that are super excited and super knowledgeable about the horror industry. And I think, Rebecca, that you're definitely one of those. So mm -hmm. talk to me kind of a, a, about the the early going. Um, you know, when did, when were you introduced to the genre as a kid and when did you, when did it become something that you knew you gravitated towards a little bit? I mean, I actually wouldn't, wouldn't really consider myself, you know, part of quote unquote horror Twitter, part of quote unquote horror journalism. You know, there are certainly growing up as kids, things that I watched that my like baby brain, it lit up the horror centers, um, the 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 boat scene and Willy Wonka like that's obviously horror even if it's not in a horror film it's scary as anything it's awful it's horrifying um but yeah from there I mean I I kind of honestly consider myself when it comes to film you know a generalist but I just gravitate towards weird shit honestly and 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 thankfully a lot of that weird offbeat stuff is is kind of centered in the horror genre 
Um, you know, I'm big into film history. I'm big into uh, into pre-code films, you know, kind of that, that very small window in the early 30s before the Hayes Code came to be enforced. And there was um, a lot more permissiveness in, in terms of what films were allowed to do, specifically with regard uh, to female characters. Um, but yeah, so I just kind of, I mean, I, I grew up in North Carolina. Um, you know, there was one really cool film like DVD rental place there, but there really wasn't much of a film community, um, at least that I was a part of. Um, so, you know, on a whim, basically, I, I moved up to New York ostensibly to, to go to film school, but mostly just to get out of suburban North Carolina. Um, yeah. And from there, I just uh, kind of fell into, you know, this film journalism crowd, including people um, you know, like Donato, who kind of helped get me into and introduce me to, you know, not just horror films, but a horror community, a community of like going to Alamo and seeing seeing Demon Wind or seeing Deathgasm. Actually, I don't think Alamo's ever screened Demon Wind, have they? It has not. I, or at <laughs> least when when we were there. So we could not go enjoy it. But we did get to see a 35 print of Predator, which was that, that, was, that was a very fun one. <laughs> But honestly, like I don't, I don't. Far be it for me to like Donato ever want to like build up your ego because that's the opposite of of what I want to do. Because you're like my little brother, and I have to give you shit. Um, but you like got me to go to that Alamo screening of Deathgasm, where I was just headbanging the whole way through, and I was like, oh, this is what it's like to like. This is why it's good to see horror films like in a group, in a community of people. Like I've, I've watched, you know, most, not, not even like most of the, you know, quote unquote horror canon. Like, I think I've seen two Friday the 13th movies. Honestly, I bounce around a lot when it comes to genres and, and, and that includes kind of a scattershot knowledge of horror. Um, but like definitely just so far in 2020, I've had, you know, this group where every week we get together and we try to like one up each other with the weirdest, most obscure horror movies. And, and, you know, that's really what I love about, about horror. And I think what we're going to touch on later specifically with this film, like it's so communal in a way that other genres aren't necessarily like being in a room when something crazy happens and everyone else just flips out. Um, there's really nothing better than that. So yeah, I like the horror films, um, the horror films that are weird. And, and ironically, I don't think this one is weird. This one's just good. I like, I, I tend to gravitate towards, um, towards weird, bad and towards older, like eighties and pre, like one of my favorite horror films is this like 1932 thing in which a man eats a cat's eyeball. So, um, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of like the big hits. I'm very like hit or miss when it comes to horror trivia, but I've seen some weird shit. And I feel like that is the glory of the horror community, though, and the horror genres as people dive into it, because there's not one path. There's mm -hmm. not one specific, you know, chronology that you would need to watch things in order, because the vastness of the horror genre is defined by its subgenres. And just as you're talking, you know, you may say that, you know, oh, like, I'm not part of really horror Twitter and stuff like that. But in the same respect, you would be so respected as a part of horror Twitter just based on your pre-code and your early, any early horror stuff, because you could talk circles around me with that stuff. Like, have I watched every Friday the 13th? Sure. Every Nightmare, of course. But in the same respect, once you go past a year for me, I didn't, I never got to that stuff yet. So I, it's just one of those things where we all go on our different journeys. We all find exactly what we want to do in the horror genre and we kind of make it our own. And I think that's, yeah. you know, what you've done and especially you, your, your Cape a day Twitter <laughs> it, it is, it's a funny thing to mention, but at the same time you keep posting all these, you know, pre code or early horror film shots of like capes. And I'm just sitting there going like, I've never even heard of any of these movies and you, you're yeah. posting capes from them. I've, I honestly watched Poltergeist for the first time, like within the past, two or three years, but I can talk to you about lesbian vampire movies and weird ass old, like Lionel Barrymore horror films called the devil dolls, where he shrinks people and sends them on like assassination missions. And at one point, no, at not one point, several points, he cross dresses. He like dresses up as an old granny. It's amazing. 
Well, let me ask, because you're talking about kind of like where your your taste does develop, you know, the horror genre has always sort of been counter-programming, right? Both in the literal sense of like, we have an A feature and we need a B feature and the B feature has to be cheaper. So you got a horror film, but it's also for a lot of people as they kind of gravitate towards the genre, it's counter-programming from the cinema that they grew up around, the stuff that was in their homes or on their screens, what they had access to. The weird stuff is what you gravitate towards. It's the stuff that separates the kind of the, the things that you're used to, the things that are ubiquitous when you really start to lock in and develop your taste. So where do you think, you know, talking about the diversity of your taste as a genre fan and as a fan of weird cinema, where's that, what is that in opposition to? Like what, what were, what were the kind of the staples that, that you took for granted is this is what cinema is that helped define when you were discovering stuff outside of that norm? I mean, I think it's just, you know, for me as a kid, you, we didn't have HBO, you know, I guess we got a DVD player when I was late middle school, early high school. I mean, my, my memory of watching films as a kid was the same three, four, five, six films on VHS, like Clue, Willy Wonka, Brave Little Toaster, and like some others, but it was just the same films over and over. And I never got tired of watching them, like the never, a- ending, the never Ending Story. But once you reach a certain point when you're like, oh my God, I can watch anything. You just want to soak it up like a sponge. You want to you wanna watch it all. I really don't like to be constrained <laughs> to, especially because with horror, I mean, there are people who... Like, I mean, I'm thinking of Ted Gagan, of Mike Gingold, of like, they host the horror trivia that I do. There are people who know every goddamn thing about every horror movie, and I can never compete with that. So I just want to watch whatever weird shit I want to watch, honestly. I mean, that lineup that you just shared with us, though, that is that is like the murderer's row of traumatizing millennial yes. childhood movies, though. So like, like, that to me locks a lot of your taste into place just because... Like if you were going to ask me what movies fucked me up the most as a kid, it, it would have been those. Like especially, especially some of the animated stuff. You know, Brave Little Toaster. That is a that that movie is scary on top of scary. There's I didn't like the scene where there's a Peter Lorre lamp who sings a song about like how all the to- all the appliances are like gonna die. There's a, a children's movie with the extended Peter Lorre reference, like that was so formative, so formative for me. <laughs> I mean, I still think about Page Master along those lines, and and the whale scene. It's just enough where that imagery. I had nightmares of a gigantic whale like swimming right towards me, mouth agape, and yeah, like it, that, I think that fits right in that canon as well. Mine was Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams scared the shit out of me as a child. I like wandered into the room, saw a few scenes and just had immediate nightmares. And I've never watched the whole thing and I'm never going to. It's a horrifying concept. You just build a build a sports, a baseball, diamond, whatever. I don't know sports. And then ghosts show up. That movie's supposed to be feel good? Fuck that. It's terrifying. I like how some people are like ghost ship. That's what sets them off. And you're like, nah, field of dreams. Like, I just don't want to build something and have ghosts show up and shit. Me. <laughs> They're not paying rent. Ghosts don't have to pay rent. Why not? Why not? 2020. No, if we can't pay a, our rent. I don't want to be a ghost landlord. No. Okay. Yeah. That's- agreed. Agreed. Ghosts can, ghosts can squat. <laughs> I got surprisingly heavy there for a moment. Um, let me back up a second, talk to you a little bit about film school too, Rebecca, because you mentioned that you decided to kind of like throw your, throw caution in the wind and move to New York, which, you know, has worked out pretty well for the three of us in varying degrees. So yay us. Um, but, you know, what type of like, were you thinking about an MFA and doing production or did you know that you really wanted to be writing and doing journal journalism and academic stuff? Like how is, how is it when you said you kind of made that very pivotal decision that you were going to go to school and actually study film? I mean, when I say school, and I and I will not name the school, but um, it was a six month certificate. It was a scam. Um, it, it but, that, got, but that's that, yeah. that's not important in terms of like the logic that you had, right? Like whether yeah. or not the school was good doesn't take away from the thought process you had of like I need to pursue this thing. And it was it it was an excuse to get me out of of uh, of North Carolina. It did get me out of North Carolina. It made me very aware that. 
making films, you know, whether as a producer or a director or a screenwriter, which are things that I tossed around, that that wasn't for me. Um, but I still loved films. So at that point, I honestly just kind of stumbled into, um, you know, first an internship with Movie Maker Magazine, which is a, you know, a print publication geared towards the the low budget independent filmmaker. You know, I just kind of stayed there until um, until they agreed to give me a job. And from there, I mean, I went to, um, you know, just just various facets of uh a film journalism to end up where I am now, um, which is at box office and, and box office pro actually. Um, and what box office pro is, we're the official publication of the national association of theater owners. So, um, we kind of are the, the publication of theater owners and of, of exhibitors and, and of theaters in the United States. Um, you know, obviously it's a very <laughs> rough time for everyone in that world right now. Um, you know, and, and in my role at box office, honestly, it's not a ton of writing about, about film. Um, certainly not the less mainstream stuff that I really love. You know, it's a lot of writing about theater technology and the business of, of, of running a theater, um, which is actually incredibly interesting, but, um, I, I still like, you know, opportunities like this and, and freelance writing, you know, at, places like Pajiba and, and sci-fi fangirls before that, you know, RIP, I still need an outlet to, um, to write about my weirder interests, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. But without where you are, we wouldn't have seen Geostorm in 4d. That was the best way to see Geostorm. I swear to God, like it's the only way to see Geostorm, oh, in my opinion. <laughs> Geostorm in 4d was excellent because it was the exact, like minimal amount of plot where the, where like the water blowing in your face and the jiggle seats weren't distracting because there was nothing to be distracted from. It was a stupid ass movie. The jiggle seats. The jiggle. Geostorm was a movie in which there was actually no Geostorm and I am pissed off to this day about it. I, I was waiting to see if Donato had a rebuttal on the Geostorm, Geostorm or lack thereof. There's no rebuttal. There's no Geostorm. No, yeah. Geostorm. It's it's a geostormless geostorm. I don't know how you how you did that. But honestly, I I do love like I've the last past couple of years when they had them, you know, I've done like the New York like the Hong Kongathon where it's twelve hours of just six like random ass Hong Kong movies and Alamo Draft House and I I honestly like just approaching that from a perspective of a fan and and just being able to enjoy it and then I get money by writing about the the, the business side of things. Well, I gotta, I, I gotta say that you know, it probably does not make its way into my conversation when I craft my narrative of how I wanted to become a film critic. You know, box office magazine is not the first thing that comes to my mind, but I worked at a at the only independent movie theater in Southeast Alaska. Um, you know, throughout my oh, Gold you know, Rush. Uh, uh, no, yes, the, it, you're close. You're the 20th Century Twin. It's the Gross Alaska, um, the Gross family in Juneau, Alaska. Um, the indie, the indie is the gold town Nickelodeon, which is run by Colette Costa. And Colette, yes, amazing. we were talking, I, I met her and she's so great. <laughs> she's yeah. I, sh- I should say, I should say the, the only, like what you would think of as a traditional, um, multiplex theater in Southeast Alaska is the gross Alaska theater chain. And Colette Costa runs the, the only good, the only worth a damn independent theater in Southeast Alaska as well. But as a kid in, in just out of high school, um, not knowing what I was going to do with my life, I, I took a job as a manager at um, the multiplex there. And, you know, I worked there off and on for the next six years throughout college. And it was it was it was box office magazine that got delivered to the theater floor that got put in the manager's office every week or every month, whenever it came out. I can't remember the cadence. Um, that I probably read as much as I'd like to say, like, oh, I was premiere and and I was reading French film criticism. Like, no, nope, it, it, the thing that I read the most, the thing that I devoured on a regular basis was Box Office Magazine. And so it's the you never know how these little where where film is going to hit you, like what angle it's going to take, what's going to be the thing that sticks with you um, and how you're going to like connect to the industry, especially if you grew up in a community, like it sounds like you and I both did Rebecca, that's far away from the lights of New York city. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's not, it's, it's far away from, I guess, like the track of where you'll generally go conversation wise, but I think the, the, the business maybe of running a movie theater and just how that works on a business level 
is understood and is maybe misrepresented by a more like sensational press, but it does have so much impact on the diversity of the types of films that get to go to the big screen versus the films that just end up streaming and and streaming's great there are so many great horror films that i wouldn't have seen if like they hadn't been picked up by shutter or what have you but um you know i i really do believe in in the big screen experience especially for horror yeah and i remember it was stuff like um you know we played at gross alaska we played 28 days later when it first came out and that was a huge deal because a i got to see that on the big screen but that was a testament to how much success it had because a lot of those smaller theaters, like like the Gross Alaskas of the world, they were that was not a day and date release for them, right? That, that wasn't an opening weekend everywhere across the world is going to open simultaneously. That was one of those where they would check two, three, four weeks of box office reports. And you would see how it was doing in major cities, how it was doing in different regions, you know, maybe the comps that you had for Alaska, like Midwestern kind of places. And if the movies, if those smaller titles seem to be holding their own, and if you could put it in your theater for a week or two weeks and you weren't going to lose money on something else that you didn't put in there, like that's where you got to see those. The reason that you got movies like 28 Days Later in Juneau, Alaska was because it was performing really well in other places. So like the, again, kind of the, there is the business and the creative decisions that go into programming in some of these smaller communities without art houses like we don't give it enough credit, but there's there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of factors. And a lot of times the people that run those places, they'd love to program the weird stuff. They just know it's not going to make money for them. This is a quick question because we have Rebecca here and I'm just going to, it just dawned on me now. I'm curious, you know, is there a world uh, when theaters in whatever capacity they're opened once again, and it's safe to go. Like, is there a world where some of these streamers, I know like Netflix dabbled with it, you know, a few dabbled with it, but something like Shudder specifically, I feel like they would do so well if they possibly opened a, a movie for like one weekend or even just an opening night premiere of like Friday. Like imagine just them getting a few theaters across the country and Impedagor gets to play like the 8 p.m. Oh. slot. Like, like, is that a possibility or is 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 it a specific choice that, you know, Shutter is just always going to be streaming. Like, like, is that just something that might like that could happen? Well, saying that with a caveat that you know, I I never spoken to to Shutter's like you know exhibition relations executives on any of this, so I can't speak to them specifically. But I right. think it's definitely a possibility. Um, you know, just over the past eight months with with COVID, obviously we've definitely seen an acceleration of uh, of the Windows process. Windows are shrinking. You're seeing more theaters, you know, playing things that are streaming, just like so many theaters right now, so many more than even last year are playing Netflix titles. Um, And now that's because, you know, it's extenuating circumstances and there's not much else to screen. But, um, you know, I do think that among the theatrical exhibition community there has in the last uh you know over 2020 been an increased flexibility in working with the streamers so i i hope it's possible i mean i know that there's honestly like a lot of stuff that no not a lot there's some stuff that i've seen at festivals um that then go to shutter and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad that more people get to see Satan Slaves or that more people get to see One Cut of the Dead. But like, damn, this would have played so good on the big screen. Um, and I I think we could get to the point where that happens. Certainly there is a lot more flexibility now than there was even like 12 months ago on streaming outfits playing in theaters. Yeah, that was I did One Cut especially because I had the experience of seeing it on a screener i didn't catch it when it played fantasia and when it actually played in the theater and it won every audience award that you know every fest it went to it was fantasia fantastic it was a few of them and it would always win the audience award and everyone raved how what like a great experience it was and then in fantasia and people kept telling i mean people people told us like the first 30 minutes you're gonna think it sucks but you gotta hold with it and like when you hit that point of where it switches and you realize what the movie's doing seeing that in a theater where everyone's realizing simultaneously what the twist is, that would have been amazing. 
Yeah, and you don't have the at-home distractions, I would say, the things that might take you out of it a little bit uh, where it's it's waiting for that moment. So, yeah, I, it was just that thought of I, I realized just sitting here, talk, like hearing you guys talk about it, going, wait, why hasn't Shudder like jumped on that already? It, it just seems like getting to watch Scare Me or the Mortuary Collection, all, like you just said, all these movies that played festivals and it played so well on the screen, like the Mortuary Collection especially, it's so practical effects heavy. The world that it builds is so fantastical. It looks great on the screen. And again, I'm, I'm so happy these things go to Shudder because so many more people get to see them at the same time. Man, I would I would be there every Friday or every, however often Shudder released something in theaters. I would be there to support it every time because I think that is so equally important. But you look at a film like Satan's Slaves, and I don't remember what year it came out, but wasn't it like, I don't know if it was like the highest grossing film ever in Indonesia, but it was up there. Like it made a ton of money in Indonesia. So like it clearly has proven big screen bona fides. Like it works on the big screen. We just didn't get that in the United States. And you know why we didn't? Because it has subtitles. And that's not saying that people, you know, it's just definitely a thing where we see a lot of these international horror films go to shutter and I'm glad they go there, but like something like tigers and unafraid for that to sit around oh my God. and play a year's worth of festivals without any distribution deal. That movie should have been snatched up the minute it played its first festival showing that premiere should have ended with a U.S. distribution deal that included theatrical, but instead it sat around for a long time for far longer than it should have. Because I wrote about it every single festival and every like festival I attended that year and recapped, I'm like, oh, look, Tiger still doesn't have distribution and it's still the best movie at this festival. It's yeah, it, it's a it's a crazy world. I mean, the film we're talking about today, it's the same thing where I think, Matt, you and I had heard from someone that like there are some rights deals, there's some complications so that, that it's not just a matter of like someone's not picking it up, but like it, it, it debuted it, Oh, I don't know if it was, I guess it was a Canadian debut, maybe, um, at Fantasia in 2018. And since then, just like, it's nowhere. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it just it doesn't exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist in that point. And Mr. Model, I guess on that note, you can uh, take us into the break and we can we can get to the film after that. Isn't it nice when the transition point just sort of happens organically? Uh, yeah, we're going to take a quick break um, with a word from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about It Comes, the Japanese Christmas horror family movie that you didn't know you needed to watch. And definitely not the porno version of It Follows. I'm so glad I did my we're going to break voice and you added that little porno bit at the end. Uh, I'm keeping that in there. I know. You better. <laughs> I did that for a reason. Hi, everyone. So it is the midpoint of this episode, and this is the time where, as always, we're going to say thank you to the people that have financially supported or read or shared articles in our podcast on Certified Forgotten. But since this is the holiday season, and no matter where you are and where we are, we're far from people that we love, you know, we thought we'd take an opportunity to kind of shine a light on some of our favorite holiday traditions that we might be missing out on this year. So, Donato, you had a, you had a movie-related, which just seems very on-brand for a movie podcast, a movie-related tradition you wanted to share. Let's start with you. Well, yeah, let's let's say it's three things I will share very quickly. And because this is the first Christmas, I won't be home, I think, ever, because I've always been an East Coast guy. I could go home pretty easily. And uh, yeah, we're not we're not traveling this year for obvious reasons. Right, Matt Mongol? Correct. In any case, my three traditions I will miss 100 percent the most. And I hope my mom listens to this so she can't say I haven't talked about her this Christmas is number one, shortbread cookies, making those with family. I enjoy very much a whole night of just, it's like that hand press cookie crank and it, you just have different cutouts basically. You're just popping out these little things like a cookie gun. I don't know, it's therapeutic to me. Number two is we do brunch. So we don't do like Christmas dinner. That's not our big thing. We make this Italian dish called strata, which is like a giant egg casserole with sausage and everything else It's delicious. And we just kind of get day buzzed and have brunch. And then the night is just everyone chilling and it usually goes into a movie night, and hopefully everyone gets drunk enough that they're like, we put Gremlins on or Annie of the Apocalypse, and I sneak my uh, Christmas horror tradition into my family, who eventually all falls asleep or leaves the room. All right. 
Well, you'll be able to have some of those traditions. You know, you can you can try your hand at making your uh, excellent egg pasta thing. Yeah. Oh, we we'll tr we'll try a little cacio de pepe this year. Where I'm going to try some internal things in LA and have a little have a little fun myself. This is a good year for you to launch new traditions and bring them back to your family next year. A hundred percent. Monagle, give me yours. So there's a few, um, you know, there's something that my family has done for a few years now, which is silly, but also sort of endearing, which is they read the night before, it was the night before Christmas, and you have an envelope with a prize in it. And the reading, every time they say left and right, you ever, stop me if you've ever done this, you pass it to the side that they mentioned. So it was the night before Christmas and right through the house, you sit in a circle and you would pass the envelope um, to the person on your right. And of course, it's a juiced version of this where they left and right are dropped in every second. But it's a fun game that you can play with all ages. And the, whoever ends up the last person at the end of the story who ends up holding the envelope gets the, the prize that's inside of it. So that was always kind of fun. Um, it's something that I, I, you know, it's basic family time too. Like I miss being able to play shitty video games with my brother, you know, to, to just like roll up and spend a couple hours in the evening doing NBA 2K, whatever. Fun stuff like that, because since he still lives in Alaska, I don't get to see him very often. But the tradition that is the most Christmas Eve traditions is a food related one for me. It's the only time of year that I eat it. And sometimes my mom sends them for Christmas and sometimes she doesn't. So I don't know when I live far away if I'm gonna get them. But chocolate oranges, uh, the kind that you, the kind that come in those little square boxes where you grab them and you just hit them as hard as you can against the table and they create those perfect little orange slices. Uh, that is by far my favorite, favorite thing about the holiday season is eating a chocolate orange, like eating it all myself instantly. Um, and you know, it, it, as the kids say, that shit just hits differently when you're at home and you, you get up on Christmas morning and it's waiting for you. So if they've come in the mail, I'll be excited to eat them, but it's not the same as when you get to whack it at home. Eh, phrasing. Fra fra phrasing. 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 <laughs> I think I feel like that's a nice family friendly way to end this segment. Yeah, so there are traditions. Unsurprisingly, a little bit of family and a lot of bit of food. Uh, and a little bit of uh, whacking it by yourself. Whacking it at home with your parents. Um, there you go. I hope that, that everyone out there who is listening, God. everyone Sweet out Jesus. there who is listening, enjoys this holiday season and that you, you know, if you can't be with the ones that you love. Oh, I, I wish that somebody had finished that sense i wish that there was a song or something that could fit i'm that still idea. stuck with where we are right now i apologize let's get back to the show all right so this week on the podcast we are gifted with it comes it comes as a 2018 horror film by director Nakashima Tetsuya. It's an adaptation of a 2015 novel called Bhagawan Kaguru by, Sa I'm very bad at Japanese pronunciation, so apologies in advance, Saramura Ichi. And uh, it tells, it is a, at the most basic um, version of it, that the, you know, the 40 word log line, the simple explanation on the ID profile, it is an exorcism film. It is about a family who lives in a space and there is a demon that haunts that space. And then they bring in experts to have an exorcism. So on a premise, something familiar, something you've seen before, but where this film takes it and the way that it sort of plays the relationship between mother and father, um, their secrets, their, the lack of faith and trust they have with each other, the very large, very government heavy exorcism organization that comes in in order to take care of this. It is an exorcism movie unlike any exorcism movie I've ever seen. It is complicated, it is rich, um, and it goes at, I think, probably like 140 miles an hour. There was a, a review in the Japan Times that referred to Nakashimi, Nakashima in particular as a visual and narrative maximalist. And there isn't probably a better way of describing It Comes as anything other than a maximalist exorcism movie. So that's the premise. We're going to get spoilery in a bit um, because there's a lot of elements that we want to talk about. But I want to start, as we always do, with our guests explaining why they picked this one. So Rebecca, um, we invited you to pick a movie and come on the show, and you had this one immediately. So what was the, what was the thought process on this? Um, oh, like I said, I mean, I just saw it in Fantasia. I, I, I loved it so much and I just want to maybe put pressure on somebody to release it somehow, some way. Um, you know, also I just really wanted to be on the podcast, but most of the movies that I know about are, are older and just more 
goofy dumb shit and not necessarily horror so this is what i had and i went with it but i love it like i know with him being a maximalist like this movie it it's what 220 like it's over two hours but it doesn't feel that long like it holds you with it yeah it, it's a it's a tight 215 and and that's right. really bonkers to say because it's still two hours and 15 minutes but I mean, you know, Rebecca, to your credit, like you picked the movie that is pretty much the thesis for our podcast. It is everything about horror films that get buried be- for one reason or another. And whether that's because they don't even have a release in the United States yet after two years sitting around after we saw it at Fantasia. I mean, that's it's a huge deal. Like it, It's the reason why no one's talking about It Comes. And the reason is because no one can watch it yet. <laughs> it hasn't come yet no like you know fantasia like it is it is a very interactive very enthusiastic uh festival that's full of just people who love films love horror films love asian films like the audience response to this film was nuts there's this there's a scene early on where the main character is, is trying to thwart an exorcism um and, and it's kind of a film that loops around in terms of the timeline. So it kind of circles circles back on itself at certain points. And, you know, it is a very character-driven film. It is a very relationship-driven film. So it, it, it kind of teases out information that you didn't know about these people and their relationships with one another um, that's relevant to how the story's going down. Uh, but it starts with that one, like, exorcism scene. And then later on, it circles back around to it. And you find out that something you thought was true about how that scene happened actually was not true. The, 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 the sold out theater audience lost their mind. It was such a fun experience. Everyone was like, Oh my God, Holy shit. It was great. Yeah. That's a pivotal moment in the film, obviously, but also I, I am so impressed by this film's ability to wield perspective and in the way that you were just talking about how many movies have we seen that try to play that gimmick where here's a scene to open the movie, but it's also going to be used later on and it's going to be important. Don't worry. It's going to have a different meaning and they never deliver that impact. You know, we get to that scene finally and it's just, okay, we saw this again. Fantastic. It like, comes, and, nails and like, that. The twist is pretty like in retrospect, it's, it's, pretty predictable but like on an emotional level it just works one of the things for those listening um that you'll need to keep in mind about this film is this film moves the pacing and editing of this film is like scenes crash into scenes not in a way that's incoherent uh it's really more if somebody took that sort of like jump cut super cut thing that um Edgar Wright does in his movies, you know, where like the Simon Pegg character is moving from the city to the country and he does all of that with a series of jump cuts. It's as if that is the pace of somebody's life. So the film unfolds with characters that are that are in moments of their life and then suddenly they're in other moments of their life and then they backtrack to moments prior to the other moments of their life. And again, it's not incoherent, but it's just sort of a way of describing sort of like the speed and the momentum that your life has and the way that like you can look up and suddenly all this stuff has happened and you know, you, you have a kid and you didn't have a kid before and it all made sense, but like life can just be fast and spurts and time moves slowly and unevenly. And the film really captures that. So we're going to talk a lot in this episode about these different parts of the story and know that they are all crashing into the other parts of these other characters' lives and the characters' different timelines, it makes sense when you watch it, but it, it moves with its own rhythm and speed that's unlike anything I've seen before. Yeah. And, and it's done in a way that doesn't feel arbitrary, doesn't feel like a shtick. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of, and it's not a, not a horror film, but, you know, Birds of Prey, the first act had, had that thing where like, it's out of chronology because, oh, Carl Harley Quinn, she's so kooky. And it was just felt like, why are you doing this it's overly confusing and what's the point um but the kind of peeling back the onions the layer of the onions of it comes you, you really are going from it's an exorcism film and through playing around with the timeline you're really getting into like no it's a it's about these characters issues with each other with their with their parents, with their children, you know, it, it really does make it take it from, I mean, I know I, 
I hate the term. I know, Matt, you hate the term. I know, Monocle, you probably hate the term elevated horror, but it is what people say when they mean that, I guess, and that it's horror, but it's it's not stupid, which is most horror, so. Yeah, which is, well, and here's where I'll go a little deeper into that, you know, without spoiler territory yet, we'll get into the real nitty gritty later, but playing off what you said, it does have that quote unquote elevated feel. And that's the last time I'll, I'll use that here. But at the same time, it doesn't play like any of those movies because it actually delivers the scares. It actually delivers the impact and the violence and the fury of this film that the opening credits is like a, like a heavy metal montage. Like, it's just like all oh, images, blah, blah. like it's, fun it is the title <laughs> scene from willy wonka and the chocolate factory yes it is the opening credits are that <laughs> yeah it's exactly that but it gets away with all of it and not only does it get away with all of it it stays so dedicated to the exorcism in a way that we eventually get to and I- i'm going to use the wailing as a comparison point because i kind of feel like it has the same overall journey as a film because the wailing starts as pretty much like a cop procedural it's not really horror forward then it gets into like a dark comedy cop procedural and things start to shift and things take a turn and then the wailing's third act is straight up invasive possession horror and to think about how that film starts and ends it's the same kind of revelation i would say in it comes for me where we are starting with a happy family about to have their first child we get through their wedding we like everything is so cheery everything is so bright and the future is so there's so much for this family little things where you're like "Mm, you can see little things no no you can definitely see little things but the tone is overtly cheery for a reason and again it it's hard thing to pull off when you when you play your hand so strong and you show your cards that early and yeah we know the happiness is going to fade we know things are going to get messed up but they're able to do it in a way that uses time cards above all else. It actually does the whole two years later, one year later, three days later. And one it keeps later. using, yeah, one day later. This movie is so good about trimming the fat to the point where supporting characters that you don't need more than in a certain few moments. I mean, like, there's a supporting character that just dies. And we have one hospital scene with them. And then we go two years later. And then it's just offhandedly mentioned, like, oh, yeah, that guy died. But. It's not a cop out because we got the relevance, the importance of that character. And we didn't have to wait around any longer to see the elongated death sequence and and like hammer emotional notes that don't need to be there. It comes as very good at telling you what you need to know and getting to what you want to see. Like there's a real almost like epic folkloric sense to the film. And, and I'm not familiar enough with Japanese folklore. Like I get the sense that probably a lot of the mythology of the film is based in, in real Japanese folklore. I don't know if that's true, but it definitely has that, that mythic folkloric sense. And it, it really does. Like, I know it's based on a book. I wish the book were translated into English so I could read it, but, but it really reads like you're just taking this like big sprawling epic and just, hitting the good points. <laughs> well, it, I feel like this is going to be apologies to the listeners. Cause this is not going to be our most coherent episode, which is a function of the film, not of us. Um, by the way, I want to point that out there because there's so many different inroads to how we talk about this movie that it's really hard. It's really hard to, to kind of talk about it in one way and be like, and there's, it comes, you're prepared for what all you need to know. Um, because we could talk about the fact that this is very much a movie about social media as much as it is about folklore as much as it is about exorcism and horror. But the one thing that I think kind of will underpin a lot of this um, and hopefully will will help you understand what we're talking about here is this is a, this is a movie um, and I'm going to arbitrarily it's 40 minutes into this episode. So let's talk a little bit more about spoilers. This is a movie where the, your, your relationship to the characters changes as you watch the film and the film doesn't think that ultimately you're going to end up liking its characters that much. And part of the way that they do that is by the fact that that you know it it doesn't it doesn't double back and like hammer home notes right it isn't a hat on a hat it isn't explicit and say like hey remember this thing that happened back when you're going to need to know that later the movie just kind of has its own rhythm and it goes and it moves and it shakes but the more you get to recognize the two main characters there's Hideki and there's Kana who are the married couple that they're 
the possession that happens is kind of at the center of their relationship. It isn't that the movie goes back and makes you watch their early days again and you see it differently. It shows you, you know, getting to know them a little bit in the early parts of their relationship. And then as we get to know them a little bit deeper, it just makes you understand how everything that you saw, like the people in their lives, is only at the very surface level. You never really see how fake he is, how unhappy she is. You never really see these things about their marriage until you've started to spend a lot of time with them. Um, and at that point, you get to realize that these are characters that have probably no business being together and maybe aren't even good people to begin with. But the way the movie does that, the way that it, it doesn't it doesn't treat it like a film thing, like where it has to introduce a concept and then tease it and then bring it back in, to the reveal at the end. It does this as sort of like, well, if we just if you spend time with them organically, you'll kind of get to not like them. It has the confidence in the character work to say, we're not going to lead you. We're not going to hold you by the nose and do this. We're just going to let you get to know them. And the more you get to know them, the more you're going to be like, Ugh. But at the same time, they're they're relatable. I mean, the issue mm -hmm. with them is Hideki was the husband, right? Mm -hmm. So his thing is that he, uh, you know, they have a child on the way. He's he's incredibly excited about it, and he creates this like daddy blog about 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 that process and kind of gains some notoriety at least among his social group of like, yeah, you're the path perfect dad, and he really builds the identity around that. And then as the film goes on, you see like no, he just wants to be the center of attention. And, and actually he's neglecting his wife. He's neglecting his child. Um, and then you see how, how kind of the wife responds to that. And, and, and then that all plays into, you know, the identity of, of the central, you know, malevolent figure during the exorcist, which it, it's related to like an abandoned child, right? It's, it's, it's an angry abandoned the spirit of abandoned children, basically. Yeah, and that's the whole point of why the child is even possessed. You know, we we and also the exorcists blame the child in a way. And, you know, there's an entity in there and the child must be dealt with because we need evil erased. And you have the sympathetic characters at this point and you have them saying things like, the child is only playing with monsters because she has nowhere else to turn. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff is so, so good. When they deliver those lines and you realize who we make the monster out to be versus, well, we also created that. It's the whole thing about when you watch a movie like Monstrum or a creature feature. It's like, there's no such thing as an evil creature feature creature. It's just the people who've created this creature and forced it to act this way. That creature was probably a, a pretty nice little whatever monster before humans got involved and turned it into the beast yeah. that it is. And it kind of is the same story here, except on a much more draining and heartfelt level because it's about a child and the parents. And one last time, maybe I'll, I'll mention perspective because the beginning of the film, it's Hideki's perspective that we're really honing in on. And that's why we see how important his writing is to him and he's always pounding away how, important, his how important his daughter is to him he legitimately right. does love and will fight for his daughter right but he, we always see him typing and we always see him on the blog and things of that nature then we get to switch to kana and all of a sudden when you see it from kana's perspective and you're looking no longer at the screen as hideki you're looking as kana at her husband obsessed with a laptop screen as her child is screaming next to him and he's just glancing over kind of going like oh i'm gonna write about how i would handle this scenario and not actually do anything about it yeah well, take it, care it of does, this one babe <laughs> it does kind of root a little bit like it, it it would be fun to watch this a second time um which i think i'm definitely going to do because your a relationship with the characters changes over time but that in a lot of ways that beginning sequence where uh hideki is taking kana back to his family home um, he lives in sort of a rural his family's from a rural community and they're going back to honor, um, I think, the 13th anniversary of his grandfather's death. His family meets every year. And like that scene becomes sort of the Rosetta Stone to everything that's going to follow. It happens too early for you to fully appreciate it in the moment. And they never go back to it. They never go back to it because they don't need to because they know that you're paying attention. But he shows up with his family. They've never they have only seen her once at the, the wedding, apparently. Um, and he's sort of like 
goes into performance mode with his family members and leaves her to fend for herself with his mom. And she's deeply unhappy and like retreats from it. And you recognize even like when they've been married for six months or whatever the time might be, you recognize the seeds of all of these issues that over the course of the film, you're going to be like, oh, these were not these were not like little how we got over it kind of things like these were foundational cracks in the relationship. And it only ever could have led to the outcome that it did. I do want to talk about the, the infrastructure of once this once this family realizes like we got an exorcism situation and we need to bring in some experts like you have this one of them is like a young woman with pink hair who's like damaged and 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 and, and thinks she can she has a connection with the kid and then her older sister is like the badass expert exorcist with like the scar on her face and just like hardcore and emotionally just no affectless just do the job it just it it feels like there's such a wider world there that I want to get to know of like exorcism goings on and in, in in the Japan of it comes. <laughs> there's such a wider like she like she's like yeah I'm just gonna call up my government friends and get them to come in and help me with the exorcism at the end. You're like no go back to that I want to know more. <laughs> Yeah, not only that, we have the ousted like television exorcist who gets debunked for some reason, and we don't really like we don't really get into it as much as we want to. And there are so many characters in here, and for those familiar, I would say with like an Alex De La Iglesia film where Beelzebub is something I also related to in a De La Iglesia film, where Beelzebub is a Mexican horror film about three different kinds of people who have to basically pull off an exorcism in the same way but like one is tobin bell who's like this badass mercenary exorcist who's been ousted by religion and the other is basically like a ghost hunter mock mockumentary character who is just trying to like you know post it online and like the other one is like the police badass who doesn't believe in anything and that's the kind of setup i get here as well in what you're just describing rebecca where there are so many characters approaching the exorcism to different ways and and the details behind them are so like rich. They're so full of life. And but it's, it's, just, also... it's just details. Like you're not, the movie doesn't sort of like, oh, we're going to go over to this character for 10 minutes. Like it keeps it tight. It keeps your attention. It does not give any, does not give anything for any character more than needs to. Like it does not get bogged down. No. And that, that plays into that, you know, third act exorcism setup because as Monagle has said before, it's a whole to do in Japan and it's a whole to do where they erect a stage and all these people come in the proper garb and attire. And there are countless people watching around on the outside, like from basically a gated off area and then everyone participating. It's like a village event basically. And it's there's, there's it, landscaping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is the Avengers Endgame portal scene of exorcisms. Yeah, I, I wish I could say, I wish I could say exactly. I, I don't have this fully articulated, but the biggest vibe I got while watching this, um, which is the highest compliment because it's the best episode of the show, I got real Clyde Bruckman's final repose um, vibes, which is the X Files episode that um, has kind of it's it's an episode that features a psychic. If you know, then then you know. Uh, basically, you were like immediately, oh shit, yes. But it's like, it's a little bit absurd and it's like a lot sad. And it's about sort of like people that that are, that don't want to see things or have gifts that they don't understand why. And they're just sort of swept up and like things just sort of happen to them. There's like this melancholy, humorous vibe. You know, sometimes if you watch, especially, I, I feel like this is especially true of Japanese horror. You find that they'll throw a lot of stuff in there and you're like, this worked and that didn't work. And it never quite cohesed, but I liked the parts that I liked. Um, so this was ultimately a good movie. This is such a weird, it's like a jambalaya of different concepts and ideas and tones and storytelling techniques. And it all just, it all just works. And man, I'd like, it's, it's hard to, it's hard. There, there isn't really anything. I think maybe Clyde Bruckman's final repose, but there isn't really a lot of things you could be like, Oh, if you liked blank, then you will like it comes. It's a it's a hard movie to recommend. We're like dedicate two and a half hours and then go watch this. Um, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Yeah, and to me, when you bring in the violence element, I'll mention the violence again. It's not because I like to glorify that kind of stuff, and a horror movie needs it, but it's just that different level where you've now taken an exorcism framework that we have seen somewhat. We keep talking about it 
it comes and we keep saying it's structure is very new, but it's still an exorcism that, you know, we've seen exorcisms before, but I haven't seen many exorcism films that get this brutal. Like limbs are just lopped off and like bloody stumps are shown and there's carnage and gore and. But it's not dwelled on. It's very matter of fact. Yeah. And then we move on. Yeah. Yeah. It's the stuff that we see and we like, we, it's almost like we don't get to process it quick enough, but we still recognize how just savage it is. Yeah, it's, it's a exorcism movie that skips over the fountains of blood and lingers on like instances of domestic violence. And you're like, huh, how does this, how is this like bruises from beatings and things like that? And you're like, why is this working? I should be so uncomfortable this whole time. Yeah. And then of course, I mean, I and then it ends on a happy note. <laughs> it's the way that you can do things in Japanese cinema and, you know, like Korean cinema, Chinese cinema as well. Like all these horror films, I think folklore is a good way to put it. And it's almost like a fairy tale. It's a really fucked up dark fairy tale in a way because it is a happy ending. And it's almost like, could that child have been happy in her home life with Kana and Hideki? Like, did that child actually get a better outcome because of the entire just terrifying scenario that unfolds? I mean, I'm all, you said that you said the wailing and I, and I really like that as a point of comparison, but then also maybe a little bit Pan's Labyrinth vibes. Like we, we don't really get it. We don't get it as much as from the perspective of the child as we do in Pan's Labyrinth because the child in it comes is like four or five. Um, but if you framed the movie differently, it would be that sort of story. It would be that sort of vibe. And, and it almost has a, I mean, I don't know. Does it have a magical realism kind of vibe to it? Because every there's there 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 are these like curses and these protections and these these supernatural forces going around, and everyone just kind of like, boom, accept it, move on, get to the meat of it. And and that's the cultural aspect too. It's it's that they don't dwell as much. It's not as much of a mystery. Uh, it, it's more accepted again because in Japanese culture, these are things that. I, you know, they are kind of more prevalent in society. They are things that are believed, the spiritual aspect. I think in American lifestyles, we don't put as much thought into it because maybe we just have a lot of differing views on things and the way that people, you know, go about their lives and what they believe in. And, you know, it's the melting pot effect. We've gotten to a place where there's a lot to question, but, you know, you you look elsewhere and that's why you get the Avengers Assemble moment because that's how much thought is put into exorcisms and things of that nature. The spiritual aspects are, you know, they're respected, they're relevant, and they're part of daily life. And and Monagle, it relates to what you were saying about how the pacing of this film is so brisk without being overwhelming. Nobody at any point, you, you need to stop and go through the requisite motions of like, uh, monsters and boogeymen don't exist. Right. Like you don't need to go through the motions of that. We're in it and then we go. Yeah, I mean, Hideki, the father, is the first one to maybe think that his house is possessed or haunted or something. And he basically has to lead his folkloric friend, his friend who is a professor of folklore, by the nose to be like, tell me that my house is haunted. Tell tell me that my house is haunted. And he's like, maybe your house is haunted. He's like, ah, there it is. (laughs) But then the friend is also like, I don't know, maybe folklore, all this stuff is a symbol for the ways in which humans mess up and mistreat children. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. not both? Why not both? It is. You, you're absolutely right there, Rebecca. It's super. You never realize how much you hate those scenes in movies until you watch like the doubting, the the obligatory doubt. And then the, you know, 20, 15, 20 minutes a movie spends being like, no, it's true. You never appreciate how much you hate those movies until yeah. you watch something that doesn't have it. We're watching a ghost movie. We know we know the ghost is real. Get to it. Right. Unless you're watching like The Boy and then, you know, one of those movies where like, oh, it wasn't supernatural. It was something stupid all along. I mean, I I, you give me 10 seconds on WebMD, I can convince myself I have diseases that have been eradicated for 100 years. So if like you, you put a ghost in my house, like, yeah, it's not going to take much. I don't need a big push. And I mean, that, honest to God, my biggest pet peeve in any horror movie, my biggest, you know, faux pas, I will say, are those characters that you're describing right there. The characters who immediately don't believe everything is in front of them. We like we waste time just having that character 
not go along with the story for so long and then they die eventually and like they get the moment where they're like oh man this is true and then like they get decapitated like it's just such an infuriating cycle to be put through over and over again and it's it's such a trope at this point in horror as the writers what what do they think that horror fans want to see the the horror fans don't need to be led through the motions of there really is a ghost but i think that's i think there's a it's knowing the audience. I also think it's replication versus originality in a way. And I'm just, I'm just going to basically say that, you know, we all watch a lot of American horror and we all see a lot of the same structural leanings, I would say, in American horror. And then we watch something like It Comes, which is international. And I feel like when I write about horror, when I talk about the invention and when I talk about pushing boundaries, I'm always talking about international or largely talking about international. Obviously, there is exceptions to any rule. But when I'm also thinking about these movies that have the same tropes and that kind of rely on the old way of thinking and rely on things that have quote unquote worked for so long, it ends up being more stateside. And I think that's just because it's just the mentality of filmmaking in a way. It's just this works. We know this works. We have the basic structure for a horror film. Why God deviate? Which is why Shudder's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, we, we are pimping Shudder often here and I will continue to do so. I mean, like my top t- 20 of ho- like horror films of 2020, when that drops, it's going to be at least 50% Shudder titles. Like I'm just like spoiler alert, but. <laughs> well, let's yeah. maybe move on to the last part of this conversation. then since you guys are talking about distribution platforms you know, full disclosure on It Comes, this is a movie that isn't streaming anywhere. If you want to watch it and you should want to watch it, you have to go the old-fashioned route and order discs. Um, for a lot of horror fans that are used to this, you know, like people that grew up in the two- early 2000s, late 1990s as uh, J-horror fans, this is not a, a new process to them at all, trying to figure out where to source some of these movies that are only available on, you know, difficult to find, like released once, limited edition kind of DVD What's stuff. the subtitle situation? We don't know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so like this, is this. there is a certain amount, there's a certain small section of horror fans that will take this as a badge of honor. They're like, I have to go find a DVD that was only released in Japan that's only going to work on my region f- free Blu-ray player. Like, fuck yeah, this is for me. Um, for the rest of us, you know, these these rights change. Movies come on to Shudder. They go away from Shudder. Stuff that was never available before suddenly becomes available. Criterion decides stuff is art and then they go find movies that like we were like oh shit i didn't even know you guys would run something like this distribution in the united states is fluid how do we find an audience for something like it comes where i swear to god we talked about it for 30 40 minutes and i don't feel like we did anything other than just like bump up against the surface of it how do we get this movie an audience where when and how does it find its audience I mean, I have no clue. It was it was distributed by Japan and Toho. I've heard there there are rights issues. Um, you know, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page now, and and it lists as a distributor Paramount. I guess the Japanese section of Paramount, but then Wikipedia. So grain of salt. I don't know. But I on like I don't know how we get this film um, available to a wider audience and like it's not some obscure thing like the director's done other stuff he did he did kamikaze girls like this is a movie that clearly has a budget (laughs) it's not it's not some obscure tiny release so i gotta think it's rights rights issues that are holding it up yeah i mean the movie has a a great budget i mean we're talking about a film that has a a room fill the blood during an exorcism to the point where the blood gushes out of the apartment window and onto the ground like there's a lot of really good set pieces and there's a lot of production design like this is one it's a scary movie yeah it's scary on levels of of the visceral horror the in your face horror and it's also scary on levels of the psychological and, and the devastating and when we talk about how to discover it this has to be something that gets a stateside release it has to be a netflix or a shutter or something i don't think something like Netflix would get it at this point because I feel like they snap, like they snag things out of festivals that are timely. Uh, and if, you know, if you don't get it quick enough, it kind of goes away, but something like shutter, they go back. I mean, they released Nori the curse, which, uh, I don't know when that came out, uh, in its home country, but it didn't have a U.S. release and it could be a shutter original because they're like, dude, this, this movie rules and it just never came out 
in America yet. So I would have to say it is the rights issues have to be real. It has to be tied up some way. And the only way that people start noticing is if Shudder picks this up. And I think Shudder is a pretty damn good place for this movie to go. It would it would fit the catalog. It would be instantly one of their better titles to have on there. There's a lot that can be done with that. I mean, I'm looking now at kind of the, the life of this movie theatrically in Japan. And if the numbers I'm looking at are correct, it was only in Japanese theaters for three weeks. Like it debuted at number three and then had a few more weeks and then like maybe it just didn't do well theatrically in Japan. So that's why everyone's kind of like not in a hurry to get it out there. But I agree with you. It would be, I mean, like I said, I'm I'm a big advocate of of the theatrical experience for horror, specifically with this title, just because I saw it in a full packed theater and it was amazing. But like, assuming that that's probably off the table, this is such a shutter acquisition. Yeah, Yeah, it's... I will add that that um, that this this is the sort of film that just screams champion to me, right? Like this is this is the kind of movie that it needs a champion. It needs somebody who works for a distributor to have seen this movie or to watch this movie, to have a friend that has the Blu-ray, and just like to become obsessed with the idea of releasing this movie under their label. You know, you hear stories like that all the time um, about people that were like, "This has been my great white whale. I chased it forever." When we're finally able to unpack the rights and release it. This is the kind of movie that is going to get released, not because there's a groundswell of support among horror fans, because, you know, the awareness of this movie is criminally low. It's because somebody at an organization like Kino Lorber or Shudder or something like that sees this movie, loves it and cannot get it out of its head, cannot rest, cannot eat, breathe or sleep until this movie has a release for American audiences under their distributor. So yeah. this is the kind of film. It just it needs a champion. And it might honestly with the way this works, they might already have one out there. There might be somebody who is working through the back currencies and trying to figure out a way to get this on Blu-ray in North America. Because, you know, I, I based on the reaction that we're talking about this years after the festival appearance, this this is not a movie that's going to go away. No. I can't think of ten movies I've I can't think of five movies I've seen that more make me want to delve into the horrors of parenthood than this. Like. <laughs> No, and like, like legitimately, like the decision process, the sub- sublimation of self, the themes of what it means to become a parent, what you give up and what you take on. Like every time you see one of those like horror films about having kids, this should be at the top of that list. This should be at the top of every list horror films about having kids because this takes you through some fucking heavy ass shit. Like just gonna swear for and stuff where there's no easy easy answer to it. Yeah, 100%. Like, I know we're not supposed to. Let, they're not like entirely sympathetic parental characters at all points, but like it they're not awful. I mean, they're awful, but you get it. <laughs> they're, 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 they're not particularly awful. Like there could be any one of us, any, any parent, at, uh, you know, uh, anybody who isn't prepared to become parents could very easily be these parents. And I think that's part of the scary element of it is just that like, you know, as Donato said earlier, like the, this girl connects to the it, the titular it, because there's nobody else there. And there are Right now, in 2020 in the United States, there's a lot of lonely kids out there. And so, you know, it's fucking and, the movie. Somebody fucking release it. I want, to, I want to rewatch this movie so bad without having to spend $70 on a Blu-ray. This is yeah, such I, a rewatcher. It's the perfect kind of, and we talked about this with Katie Reif when she was on here and she brought Funky Forest. And it's the same scenario where we had to go around and, you know, find a way to find it that... uh you know, we just had to figure out. And I think Funky Forest was actually streaming. We did find it somewhere and we could rent it and whatever. Like it worked out. But for a movie like this or uh, Jenny Nolf brought X-Day hair extensions and we had to buy the, the DVD for that because we couldn't find it anywhere. It didn't have that US streaming release or anything that we could go back on. So, you know, we still went back and got the DVD because these movies are good enough where they stay in the canon and people keep talking about them. And I remember it comes when it came out you know, we weren't the only ones that saw it and loved it. There were a lot of other critics who saw that film. And that was one of the most talked about. I'd say that was probably one of the most talked about titles, I guess, that year at Fantasia between, I think Katie mentioned it. I think Josh Hurtado mentioned it. It got a lot of mentions. So I can't believe this is, this is going to go away from the conscious and this is going to just vanish because I see enough and I hear enough. And I guarantee you when I tweet this episode and say, Hey guys, remember it comes. Well, we just talked about it for like an hour. I guarantee you there are going to be plenty of responses going like, still waiting for that release. Holy crap, I don't get it. That feels like the final word on that for me. 
Any last lingering Bhagawan thoughts that we want to throw out before we wrap up? Uh, just two words. Omelette rice. Oh my god, I want to go to the Omelette Rice Kingdom. Ooh. Honestly, you, have to, you have to see It Comes to find out what that is. If you can it is, see It Comes. That's my new earworm. I'm not going to get that out of my head. Yeah, if you get through if you get through the heaviness of the film, you are treated with a very like Sean Soto esque little dream sequence at the end. Something like a little you can have a little bit of happiness as a treat um, at the end of that movie, and it will definitely yeah. make you want to Google omelet rice. It comes omelet rice uh, slash dead sushi eggy crossover. Oh my god, the crossover that we need, and well, actually, just that I need, but still. All right. Well, that is that is our It Comes episode. Um, do, if you are in a position that you're willing to take expensive gambles on foreign releases, um, I'm, I'm going to say this is, the, this is the one you gamble on because you'll feel really cool because you've seen it and your friends haven't. Uh, Rebecca, I want to say thank you for coming on the podcast first. If people want to follow your writing, uh, but more importantly, if they want to see your capes and just connect <laughs> on social media, what's the best way to do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-P-A-H-L-E. I spell it out because it's a weird one. Um, or as as uh, as you've mentioned, I do have an alternate Twitter account, a cape a day, where I just, every day I post a gif of some movie cape because I really love movies and I really love capes. So I feel like you and what is the other Twitter account dancing on film are like the only two pure film Twitter accounts. Left. I love dancing on film so much. It's, a, it's just Cape a day and dancing on film. That's all we have left. We've, we've t- made the ground toxic on everything else. Mm. Uh, Donato, my man, promote yourself and the, the work that's coming up because you've mentioned a end of the year top 20 list. I feel like people are going to be interested in that. Oh, I've got, yeah, I got a lot of things coming out. So you can follow me at Donato Bomb on Twitter, Letterboxd, and Instagram. The tweeter is going to be where a lot of that stuff hits. And uh, yeah, I still have yet to post my horror top 20 for the year, my personal top 10. I may have something premiering tomorrow or the day after on a new byline site that I'm very proud of. So we got a lot of, a lot of we're going to close the year out really strong on uh, Team Donato. And also I created an authory page and I'm going to plug authory very quickly because it's my new favorite thing. I am terrible at having a personal website where I put all my links and I, I try to do it every once in a while. And basically I do it for three weeks and then I forget for another year. And authory does all that for you. So now I have a website that it just pulls from every single publication I write for Every single day, it will update with all my new work. So I don't know. If you guys want to follow me, look up my authory, Matt Donato, and uh, su- subscribe to my email newsletter. I will say I also got authory recently, and I had some like issues where it was pulling up the wrong, like it was pulling up every byline. Long story short, the, the people there, like they get shit done. They fix shit for you. That's yeah, my I, authory I, plug. They're awesome. <laughs> I had, I had a, the same thing you said. There was one little quick thing we had to talk about, and I had the issue solved in literally not even a day. So responsive, great, and it is now my new favorite tool as a freelancer. If you are also a freelancer, I highly suggest Authory. Apparently, I'm not the only. I'm the only person here that isn't getting some of that sweet, sweet Authory money. So, goddamn. <laughs> um, no, you can follow my work the old-fashioned way on Twitter. That's Lab Splice L E B S P L I C E. Um, I I'm probably by the time that you listen to this, have, I'm going to have set up an Authory account because uh, I'm sold based on what the two of them are saying. So you can check me out on there. I don't know what my username is. It'll probably be something involving my last name. Um, but yeah, as always, uh, please visit certifiedforgotten.com. Check out some of the cool film criticism that we're publishing. We've got a lot of really good, just it's, it's, we're closing the end of our first year of being able to publish two editorials, about six editorials a month from a lot of really cool and exciting voices that write about horror and some people that don't usually write about horror, but get an opportunity to talk about the genre. Um, it's probably the thing I've done in film criticism that I'm the most proud of is being able to have that run every week and be able to share stuff with you. So certifiedforgotten.com, check it out. You'll be glad you did. All right, uh, Rebecca, you've already claimed, you're the first guest to, to, before we record your first episode, demand that you come back on for another episode. So I am not going to say goodbye. I am going to say, see you later. We will see catch you down you. the road. Yeah, we'll catch you on your, your, your next episode in a little bit. Thank you guys. It was, uh, it was so great. Thanks for having me. Donna, there's no more appropriate way to take us off with this guest. Avalet Rice Kingdom. <laughs> Let's do shots of fireball. <laughs>